Our hearts and our minds and our experiences are truly upside down. And looking at your word through the prism of this world always confuses us. So help us to look at this world through the prism of your word. Give us eyes to hear, or eyes to see, <laughs> ears to hear what your word has to say to us today. This we pray in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm talking to God, just like when I'm talking to you, sometimes I can screw that up real bad. But it did sound super spiritual at one point, didn't it? <laughs> Give us eyes to hear. And you guys are praying with me, so you're really cool about that. And you're like, wow, eyes to hear. You know, that was just a mistake. <laughs> I don't rehearse the prayers. Can you see me in the back room, right? Let me think of a prayer to pray. No, that's not how it works. I just pray, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> this letter written by Paul the Apostle to a pastor named Titus whom he'd left to appoint elders and leaders in the church there in a little tiny city named Crete in is it an island? It's a whole island? But it was, it was back then back then would have been a little smaller well there were little tiny churches in this big island of Crete <laughs> When it was small as compared to like Ephesus. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he writes this letter and, 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 and says, hey, I want you not just to appoint people. I want you to appoint the right people. And at first, it might seem like a bunch of rules and regulations, things that we fall short on. But in looking at it from the perspective of Titus and the people he's caring for, it's important because you want your leaders to reflect these things. You would expect them, if I tell you we have three pastors here, we have myself, Austin, and Lee, they're the pastors, and what, it, what would you expect them to reflect? What if I left my phone on the floor and you picked it up and the first thing was, whoa, my goodness, sorry, pastor, you know, you think he's just a regular guy just like everybody else, but I'm not. I'm a regular guy like everybody else has learned the lessons in this book that I must have ready two things, sober and reverence. Sober and reverence. Above everything else, what we're going to see is that the man of God, the woman of God must be sober and reverent. Now that sobriety is not the sobriety where I don't drink, I don't do drugs anymore. It's a sober thought. What it is, sober means is the personal responsibility and the personal personal ability to limit one's own freedom. I have freedom in Christ. I could do whatever I want. Jesus still loves me. If last night, and I was not, I was online looking at pornography, drinking beer till I was stinking drunk, went out, snorted coke, did pills, went to a strip club, passed out in the street, got up at 6 a.m. and said, thank God they turned the clocks back, I need another hour. Got here at 8.39, 10 o'clock rolled around and here I am. You think God's gonna look and go, I hate that guy. No, he's not. And if that in any way, shape, or form reflects some of your guys' lives, welcome home. I'm glad you're here. God loves you. But what happens when you grow a little bit, a little bit at a time, you want your personal freedom to become your personal responsibility. Do you understand what I'm saying? I have not mastered, but learned that my freedom in Christ now must be tempered with what is right. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And then that word for reverence, phenomenal word reverence. It's the mixture actually described by Socrates as the mixture of caring what everybody says and what nobody says. It's the perfect balance between worrying about what everybody thinks about you and then worrying about what nobody thinks about you. It's a reverence. It's coming in to hear and having this, well, I want to be a regular guy, but I don't want to be so much of a regular guy that I forget I'm in church. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So with that thought in mind, let's read. But as for you, speaking to Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men, now that word for older doesn't necessarily mean older, it means more seasoned. It means the people have been in church for a few years. If they've been there for more than four or five years, if they've been there, not just older men, because older men could be younger men in Christ. This is what he means, though. The older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Sounds like something you'd want your leaders. You come to me, you knock on my door, and you say, Pastor Ryan, could I sit down with you for a sec? And I go, of course, that's what I do here. Can I talk to you about marriage? And I go, well, here's the thing. I can, I can tell you about marriage, but it's only going to be from the Bible's perspective because my marriage is pretty messed up. And you're going to be like, well, okay. But how much more would you, would, it, would you feel if you knocked on my door and you said, Pastor, I need help with my marriage, and I know you've been through a lot, and you and your wife are still hanging in after 25 years. Doesn't that give you a certain... You don't want some drunk telling you how to get sober. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and drunks are great at telling you, you need to stop drinking. I'm telling you, you can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> you need a job, man, and you need to stop drinking. <laughs> get right on that. My brother was the best at that. Boy, <laughs> he could have been crawled out of the gutter, and he would, he'd be there to tell you exactly how to live your life. He was the best at that. Verse 3, the older women, seasoned women, likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. You could circle slanderers, write gossipers. Not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now you see it says not given to much wine. That doesn't mean not given to any wine. That means if you and your wife want to go out, but now you're Christians and you don't think you should drink, you shouldn't. It's that simple. But if a, a glass of wine, I mean, we live in America, and America is one of two ways. You're either slobbering drunk and you know you don't care whoever thinks about it, or you're completely straight and everybody else that does is bad. But in some societies, and I grew up in an Italian household, there was always red wine on my table. And that from a very young age, my father would pour that, you want some wine? Here's some wine, taste it. And if, if, if any of you ever had the dry red Italian wine, man, it's like putting a sponge in your mouth. As soon as it goes in, you're like, <laughs> And if you swallow, you're, oh, I'm never drinking again. That's right. Don't ever drink, son. It's bad for you. <laughs> if God's knocked on your heart and said, stop drinking, stop drinking. If he hasn't, then what's it doing to your life? What is alcohol doing to your life? I'm just going to let it sit there just for a second. Because I don't want to distract what God's telling you right now. Let me, as a matter of fact, I'm going to stop talking. What is alcohol doing to your life? What is alcohol doing to your life? Maybe it's time to stop. Teachers of good things. Now, I love the way he says teachers of good things. The Apostle Paul, the one who told women to be quiet, to hush up. The one who the world says, see, the guy's sexist. The Bible is sexist. The guys that wrote the Bible are misogynists. They don't like women. Um, the same guy that they say, he's telling you, teach good things. You want to be a teacher of good things. The Apostle Paul never intended nor meant that women should be quiet, shut up, you should be seen and not heard. No, on the contrary. He exhorts them, come on ladies, teach, teach, teach. Okay, so next week your wife's going to be teaching? No, no, not here. Oh, you see, you're as sexist. You're as sexist. you as good at English too. <laughs> That they admonish the young women, verse 4, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Okay, 
I'm camping out here for a second. You see that word for discreet? I want to stay there. The word for discreet is super important. It's deep and it's wide. And here, what's going to happen as I tell you these things, I want you to know that every single husband is going to be hardly convicted. I'm telling you, God is going to smash your heart right now. But what he's going to do to you, ladies, he's going to make you yearn. Because this word discreet is an absolutely beautiful word. Let me explain to you what this means. Putting my Bible aside for a second and focusing in. A husband and a wife, a man and a woman, they desire above all things one thing from each other. A woman wants above all things security. A man above all things wants to be the hero. Discreet means to cover one another with good things. You want a happier life, husband, wife, never let anything come in between you guys. You say, oh, I'm talking to my best friend on the phone, it better be your wife. If you're talking to your best friend on the phone, ladies, it's supposed to be your husband. And when it's not, it's our own fault because we've allowed slowly and surely the technique of the enemy working in this world to allow our wives to fully believe that they're not the most important and that there is a wedge in between you. Never should your wife ever find an email, a text message, a conversation of you saying negative things about her to anybody. Listen, I'm not telling you you're not going to fight. Me and my wife get into a hassle, we get into a hassle. Uh, I'll say sometimes horrible things to her. She'll say horrible things to me. But never let her find out that you are doing it to somebody else about her that breaks her security. You, man, are not being discreet. And if you want, again, the peace and the happiness that comes with a marriage, oh, there's a lot more than just being discreet, but believe me, that is step one. It will never happen. If your husband thinks for a second that you're telling your friends something about him that he doesn't know. If he feels that way, for, let me tell you something. You emasculate him. God forbid he finds out you're talking to another man about stuff like, oh, that's just my, I hear women say, oh, that's just my best friend. Your best friend is a man and you have a husband? No, it ought not be. And believe me, I know in, in, a, in a room this size, some of you guys are like, you don't know what you're talking about because I have a best friend. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. 25 years together with my wife. I know what I'm talking about. The greatest thing that I ever did is allow my wife to understand and to know there's nobody in between us. Nobody. Nobody. No man, no woman. I talk to nobody else. Now sometimes I'll talk to... My father-in-law, my mother-in-law, I'm like, your daughter's nuts, okay? But she knows that. She knows that. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about she never is, and as soon as she sees, and, ready, let me paint a picture for you, and I hope it's okay, baby. I hope you don't get mad at me. <laughs> okay. I, as a coach at my gym, have fighters. She picks up my phone and she sees a girl's name. And because my life is open to her and there is no passwords, there's no, there's, she doesn't have to be asked for any access to anywhere, my pictures, my anything. It's hers to open at any point in time. Gentlemen and ladies, rule number one, there is no secrets. Zip. That's it. If your wife doesn't have the password to your phone, you've already lost. You've already lost. You've already broken down the major key in the relationship. So she picks my phone up and she goes, she sees a girl's name. And under it it says, I love you. And under it says, bother me anytime, it's no problem. 
I miss you. I care about you. I want the best for you. Now you ladies are like, oh man, that's bad. <laughs> and in her heart immediately it was betrayal, pain. How dare you? And I go, baby, wait, 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 wait. Look at my other fighters too. All the guys' names. I love you. I miss you. It's no bother. Now, it made her feel a little better. <laughs> but I had to immediately open everything up completely on Listen, there's no, here's her number. You want, I never want you to see she's done. I never okay, done. I never ever want sh her to think that there's anybody between us. There's not. 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 <clears throat> And as many reasons for the positive as the negative exist, meaning, yes, I want her to know that she's safe, that I am going to be discreet. I will cover her. I will not uncover her. But also, don't complain that there's no peace in your house, my brothers and sisters, if you are breaking these simple rules. This is rule number one. Man, things are in my house. I can't, my wife is this, my girlfriend's that. Da, 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 da. Does she have the um, access to your emails? No way. <laughs> you expect it different then? Well, you know, I've got business things in there. Your wife can't see your business? And that's when I usually go, look, dude. I ain't been a pastor my whole life, okay? <laughs> I understand why you don't want your wife. No, no, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I understand. No, no, dude, really, it ain't like that. Stop! This word again, to be discreet, to cover each other. Listen, you know how messed up I am? You have no idea how messed up I am. You have no idea the baggage that I carry around in this brain, the way I grew up so different than the vast majority of you grew up. You that come from any kind of home that had a normal mom and dad, you have no idea that I did not grow up like that. And it, it comes, and, and I'm not saying this to separate myself from you. So many of you guys that are in here now, you, I want you to go, I know what you're talking about, brother. I was there. I'm not, oh, I've had it worse. I did not have it worse than anybody else. But I had it very different than most people had a husband and a wife and, and mom and dad are still together. And very different than my wife. But you know, you're never going to hear about it. You know why? My wife covers me. She keeps me covered. She knows about my moods. She knows about my paranoia. She knows. She goes to the store. She's at Publix. And all of a sudden she's walking around Publix and she, she bumps into me. <laughs> what are you doing here? I needed something. <laughs> you could have texted me, but then I wouldn't have been able to follow you around and see who you were looking at and what you were doing and what you were getting and who you were talking to and if you've deleted things off your phone or not. I checked the tread on your tires. <laughs> Are you that wacky? <laughs> yep. Why? None of your business. <laughs> and you'll never know. At least you'll never get it from my wife. I might talk about it sometime here, just to help other people. Covering each other to be discreet. Now there is a time to reveal stuff, especially in front of a pastor. As, as a pastor, I am by law and by scripture bound. You come in my office and you go, I'm telling you, here's what's going on. And you tell me something. And I go back and I go, Marty, you won't believe what this dude said. No, that's not what happens. <laughs> I am bound by law and by scripture. Lockdown. Total down low. So you don't have to worry about that when you're talking to me. But me, to get you to the point in, in raising you up, and your marriage gets stronger and stronger and stronger you will, to where your wife now is totally safe. Totally safe. Last story about my wife I'm going to tell you. Here's how it worked and it happens to every single man. I got married and I realized that every time me and my wife would have a fight it would end up being really cool afterward. <laughs> so every time we'd have an argument I would hurt her until she would cry, and then we would make up. It was just, it was great, it was easy. 
you're bothering me, I'll just say something really ugly to you, you cry, we make up. Well, after about 10 years, 10 years, she ain't crying no more. And I've erected a wall, brick by brick, by brick, by brick, by brick. And now that's a hard-hearted woman. And there's no more. You're not going to hurt me no more. Because that's self-preservation. That's a normal thing. And I remember a pastor telling me, here's what you've done, son. She doesn't feel safe around you. You've not been discreet. And now the wall is erected, and you're on the outside. And I, 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 what, do I, I, what do I do? I've got to start all over again, being discreet. Making your wife know that she is the most important, and there is, and it little by, and it took years and years and years for her to cry. And the first couple of times that she cried, <laughs> there's like as a mixture between sadness and happiness because here I wanted to, I wanted her to be safe, and I don't want to make her cry, but she felt safe enough to cry in front of me. If your wife has ceased to cry in front of you, it's because she don't feel safe in front of you, dude. Well, she don't love me. No, she's not safe in front of you. You've not been discreet. You guys all understanding me? And I know, like I said, I know this conviction here because we all do it. But it's never too late to start over. That's the greatest thing about it. Again, first rule in marriage. Wife wants security. She needs to feel safe. And that can be covered in many ways. Some women, oh, we need insurance policy. What if you die? That's her letting you know she's not secure. And sometimes it'll come out in the physical, it'll come out in the spiritual, come out in so many ways. Men want to be the hero. Don't worry, baby. I got a gun. And I will shoot anybody that bothers you dead. I promise you. Oh, that's, don't even say that. But there's a part of their heart that goes, my man protects me. Believe me. Oh, I don't want a gun in my house. Okay, that's your house. My house, my wife feels safe. My kids feel safe. They know. I will stand in front of a bullet for them. No question about it. And no man, no woman is going to know anything about my wife. That's my woman. Discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now what does he mean when he says that the word of God may not be blasphemed? Let me tell you what happens is the world looks and they have their description of what they think a Christian marriage should be looks like. And they say, see, we get divorced two out of three marriages. And then they look at the church and they go, wait a second. You guys get divorced two out of three marriages. What's the difference? It's called blaspheming the Word of God. That's called the very marriages that are supposed to be the pillars aren't. Because the things that I'm telling you now, people don't want to hear. Some of you guys might not come back. You don't know what you're talking about. My best friend is this. You don't know what you're talking about. I have this. It's okay. Don't come back. Rather you not come back here than somebody let you blaspheme the Word of God. Our marriages are supposed to be different. They're supposed to be. And my job is to help you get to there. Now that's not to say any of you here are not there yet. Of course, it's an ongoing thing. We, we strive every day to get there. And you have been married less than 10 years. Believe me, you know zero about marriage. There's an old saying in jujitsu: You don't even start to learn until you get your black belt. You hear me? You hear what I say? You don't even start telling. It takes to get a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, it takes most men between six and ten years. I'm a brown belt. I've been doing Jiu-Jitsu almost eight years, over eight years. Brown belt. I still got a year and a half to go. And I don't start until, I don't start learning. You don't even start learning till after ten years, Jack. You hear me? How many of you guys have been married? Six years. Green belt. <laughs> Eight years? I know you. White belt. <laughs> that's if you've made your wife your study. Man, you're coming down hard on the brothers. Why? Listen, 
It's a simple thing. You are responsible for the health. You are the priest of your house. You're supposed to be the pastor of your home. You're responsible. Now, that's not to say, ladies, you don't got a part in it and you don't have something to do about it. Now, you single brothers and sisters out of here, don't tune out. Don't tune out. Learn this lesson. Be smart. Learn. Listen now. You won't have to worry about it later. Right. Verse 6, likewise exhort young men to be sober. You see how that word sober? Young men. So my job is you who are young in Christ. You've been walking with the Lord two, three, four years. First rule is be sober. Learn how to not let your freedoms take you to places where it should not. Young Christian men, first thing you want to do is realize just because you can doesn't mean you should. Ready? Again, ladies, just because you can doesn't mean you should. That comes to dressing, dating, out with the friends, drinking, whatever it is. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. I like he puts it in another, he puts the same verse in another uh, way. He says, not everything is profitable even though everything is possible. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, there's that word again, incorruptibility. Sound speech that cannot begin. Now listen, go back a second. Showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. You did not come to church here to be entertained. If you did, you came to the wrong place. My job as a pastor is to get your butt out of that seat and get to be doing some good works. If any of you have not done ministry yet, you better be brand new to our church. We've got plenty of places to serve. We go door to door. Oh, I don't like that. I'm shy. Okay. We go to the convalescent. Well, I don't like that. Okay. We'll help clean up the church. Well, I don't do that. Listen, what do you do? I go to church. I have now failed. That's my failure. Because according to Scripture, my job is to get you motivated. Now again, if you're new in the Lord or if you're new to the church, by all means, let the foundation set. Let the cement get a little hard. I'm, I have no problem with that. But there is a time where I, when some of you guys, it happens every single... I'm doing the, I'm doing the announcements and I say, Hey, Ryan goes out and, and, and we got Mr. Corn over there. Brian wants to go start a ministry. And some of you guys, man, I know your hearts are like, Man, I got to do that. I should, I should really do that. But Saturday's the morning I... Okay, well, I'm telling you right now, young man, let your life be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Tell you a quick story. In case you guys are new to the church, the first thing the Lord did in my life, and it was supernatural, miraculous, was take away my foul mouth. Being a New York Italian, coming from the streets of Queens, I had very clever ways of adding curse words to every other word that I used. Uh, my mother's speech could have made a truck driver blush, and me and my father and brothers were twice as bad. But literally, the day I got saved, the day I surrendered my life to Christ, broken, a, crying on the floor, and I'm not a crying man, the next day I woke up and I said a, a four-letter word, and I went, what was that? That was weird. My wife was like, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> but I felt like every time I cursed, God was mad at me. Don't say that! Because that's how the only picture I had of God, because that's how my father treated me. Shut up! I'm like, oh man, I better not do that. I better not say that. Not knowing it was God's gentle spirit on my heart going, son, you don't need to do that no more. What if I do? I love you anyway. Now, a love that I never understood. So trying to reconcile God's love for my Father's love and not understanding how different it was was so confusing. So God takes away immediately. Now, I own a business. 
and a couple of kids came in and they were looking at some stuff and I was talking to them and they were tapping on the glass and I said, hey guys, please, don't tap on the glass. And one of the kids, apparently he'd never been corrected, his mother never taught him anything. So, believe it or not, right, that's hard to believe in our day and age. And he goes stomping out of the, out of the store. And his mom comes in and says, did you just cuss my son out and tell him to get the F out of your store? And I looked at her and I said, not me. And it was, I remember, that's, and I'm going back 15 years. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, just a couple years ago, I would have done that. <laughs> Told this little 12 year old turd head to get out of my stand, and cussed him out and I sent him. But because my speech had become incorruptible, because it was, how did he put it? Condemned? Yes. It could not be condemned. I looked at her and I said, absolutely not, ma'am. Would never say that. And my employees at the time were, believe me, it wasn't him. Mister, I don't curse, you know. <laughs> and that's the first thing, that's, that's like the second thing that happens. As soon as you stop cursing, you think everybody else should. And then after a while, you really don't care if anybody else does. And now, now when people curse in front of you, oh, sorry. And like, don't say sorry to me. I don't care if you curse. It's your business. You want to curse, you curse. I don't curse. Every, people do that. Any, any other Christian that do that to you? When people curse in front of you, like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that because I know you're a Christian. Like, like, I care, you didn't curse against me. I don't have virgin ears. I've heard those words before. <laughs> have I been a little bit controversial? Well, pardon me as I get very controversial. <laughs> Verse 9. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters. Now, so many opponents of Scripture, the same that use this very same Scripture to say why the Bible is misogynistic, are the same that say, see, the Bible owes okay with slavery. Here it's telling slaves to behave to their masters. That's exactly what it was saying. And the Bible was absolutely for slavery. Slavery was very, very important and very, very good. But let me explain to you what slavery was in the Bible and how we have destroyed what is slavery. When somebody's life reflected poor choices and they absolutely destroyed their own life, you could be what's called a bond slave or a bond servant or a slave. You can go to someone's house because they had fields and you could say, listen, I'm your brother's, sister's, husband's friend. I am your neighbor. I will make myself your slave. And the man could say, absolutely, come on. And they put you out in the field working. And that was okay in scripture. Now your master had to feed you, clothe you, take care of you, and house you. And more important, in seven years had to set you go. It took about seven years for those bad choices that you've made. And then you set him free. Not only that, he was required by biblical law to give you some stuff to go out, to start a new life, the way it was supposed to be. Now what happens is the Jews get enslaved and the Babylonians absolutely wrecked them for a thousand years. And then in our own country, the Africans get enslaved and we absolutely do not follow scripture in, in that either. And now we think slavery is bad. Oh, the way we did it's bad. We have a new term for slavery. You know what it's called? Welfare. <laughs> when you give somebody something for nothing and expect nothing, you enslave them. You with me? Now, if you are very sensitive to these things and I'm offending you, please let's talk afterward. And I will show you the scriptures that it says what slavery is supposed to be. Now, slaves who work for somebody, we could put to it, we can apply this to a job. We can say, hey, listen, if you are an employer, which is more what slavery is supposed to be according to scripture not what we as I don't even say we because 
I'm from the north and my folk fought and died so that African people didn't have to be enslaved anymore. I mean, I hope that you all do that, especially my black brothers and sisters in here. You understand that? There's a whole section of our country, 500,000 of us lost our lives. My great, great, great grandfathers setting this free because knowing it was a non-biblical practice that was being practiced. So let's break up that whole black-white thing for a while, shall we? Again, exhort bond servants, your slaves, to be obedient to their masters. He's saying, okay, I want you to tell people who are slaves, listen to your masters. Be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior and other things. Because slaves back then who worked for somebody, well, they knew they were supposed to get paid, but they were, a lot of them were bringing the same habits that got them to lose their whole thing into their new quote-unquote job. <clears throat> Slavery. Don't rob from your master. The guy just put you to work. He just rescued you. Why are you robbing him? Why are you talking back? Why are you... Man, the guy put you up. He's giving you a job. He's giving you a house. He's giving you food. He's saving up for seven years. So that after seven years, at the time of what the Bible called Jubilee, you set all your slaves free. Because God doesn't want slavery. God doesn't want people to be working for you. God wants people to go out and help other people. Take your slaves, send them out, let them have their own field, let them raise it up, and let them help other people who are going to be slaves, who have made bad choices with their lives. But what we made, what Babylonians made it to the Jews, and what a lot of the Americans and other countries did with the Africans was not biblical slavery. I mean, there should be a worse word for it. I wish there was a word that would really describe what that was. Now, if we're going to apply slavery to that word, okay, then let's erase slavery from our vocabulary. Gone. Let's call it a job now. Okay. Employees, employees, be obedient to your bosses. Be well-pleasing in all things. Don't talk back. Don't rob them. But show all good fidelity. Meaning take care of their stuff like it's your stuff. <laughs> they call that a fiduciary responsibility. Like it's yours. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You, even as the lower, could look to the, the higher, can look to you and go, Man... What a guy. Why are you such a good employee? Because I really don't work for you. I work for the Lord Jesus. And I treat you as if you were him because that's what my word says to do. And God shall, shall, shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. And I don't, although I'm glad you're pleased, I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please Christ, boss. What a difference. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And the implication there is rich people don't think you got the only ticket to heaven because you don't. You don't. As a matter of fact, there was a guy who said it's harder for a rich man to go through the gates of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that was the implication there. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Who doesn't believe that? The world doesn't. The world thinks it but doesn't believe it. We are the ones who are supposed to have different lives. It's supposed to reflect sobriety. It's supposed to reflect reverence. You expect that. That's why at the men's conference I showed a pastor who curses from the pulpit. And everybody thinks he's cool, man. And he's got a mega church because everybody thinks he's cool. Like there's no reverence. This dude is not filled with the Spirit. The Spirit, come on. Teaching us, the Holy Spirit teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present age. Don't you expect that of me? Don't you expect that of Pastor Lee, of Austin, of Matthew? 
of John? Don't you expect that from your leadership team? I mean, you should. You have the right to expect it. And you should. Because this is what the Bible says. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all. Listen, he says, and as we close... Jesus Christ redeemed you from these things. Redeemed like a bot, like a can. You ever see, remember the cans? When I was growing up, you take a can and you put it on the ground and you squash it. Boom, and you bring it to the store, you get five cents. And you see in my old neighborhood, they're, they're, they'd have uh, the homeless people, we called them, we didn't, un, you know, not right, we, we called them bums. Look at a bum. And he'd have garbage bags full of cans because we were so rich, we didn't care about our, we threw it, you know, stomp it, throw it in a bag, and, and there they'd be, and they'd have tons of cans, and then they'd be walking them to the store. That's us. He redeemed us. He redeemed us. We had that crushed can, and we threw it out. Who needs him? And God comes by like that bum did. I'll take them all. I'll take them right to the store and redeem them. <laughs> redeem them all. And not one, no matter where it was, that bum would find it. He would find it, man. He'd look underneath. He'd, he'd look in the garbage. He'd look in the bottom. You ever see the bottom of a... How many of you guys grew up in the city? City? Did you... Just a couple, huh? Wow. <laughs> we used to have these things called schoolyards or parks, but it's not like a park here. There we had a park, and, and, and the garbage man would come around every few weeks and throw a garbage bag in there, and people would throw all kinds of vile things in there. And God, I mean God, the bum, he'd look for that can at the bottom, and he'd go through that nastiness, the foul filthiness, the chicken that somebody threw out two weeks ago. He'd find that can. God does that to us. He goes through the nastiness of this world, the foulness and the filthiness of our heart, and he sees what we've done. He knows the depths of our immorality. He knows the depths of our foulness. And he doesn't mind going in it and getting us out and redeeming us. Isn't that great? Nobody is out of his reach. No matter what filthiness you've put yourself in. And then the last thing he says in, in this chapter to Titus, he says, I want you to speak these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Just don't worry about it. He says, don't, don't worry about what anybody says. You speak these things. Well, what if your church doesn't get big? <coughs> I'm not here for that. Whoever is here, I want to help you. I'm not, I don't want you, hey, we're going to have a drive next week and everybody invites a friend and I'll give them a free iPod. Don't invite nobody, okay? Let them look at what God's doing in your life and let them ask you to come to church. Speak these things, Ryan. Exhort them. Rebuke them with all authority. Let no one despise you. And that is not let no one despise you. That means don't care if they despise you. Have reverence. The ability to care a little bit, but not too much. And finding the proper balance right in between. That's, my exhort That's God's exhortation to me. Close your Bible. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there's no time like the present to just ask Him into your heart. There's no prayer I can give you that's a magic word. It's just a matter of sitting there for a second and saying, Jesus, take my life. Something has happened. Now, please understand, and, and I am giving you a caveat here. Married couples, I pulled you into something that could potentially start a fight, a big fight, a, a marriage ending fight. And I want you to be careful. I'm warning you this. There are levels of communication. There are four levels of communication that me and my wife went through this communications class years ago. Level four being, hi, goodbye, nice to see you. Level 
Three is a little deeper. How was your day? Oh, really? Talking about your other interaction with people. Level two is an intimacy. It's sharing your emotional feelings. And level one is complete openness, like I was talking about. Now, if you've been living at level three and four, and now I just drug you up to level one, it's going to create major upheaval in your life. Please don't let that happen. I don't want to be responsible for huge fights. Come and see me. If it does, we'll sit down. We'll do some marriage counseling. We'll talk about what the Bible says. We'll give you some suggestions. But do not leave here and go, see, that's what you always do. You know it. Listen, that won't help you. Believe me when I tell you it won't help you. We all fall short. All of us. I have not gotten that down yet. Not gonna, probably till I get my new body, my new heavenly body. Don't let me start a fight in your relationship. You don't, listen, ladies, listen to me. You don't want your husband to be like me. Don't ever do that to me. Why can't you be more like Pastor Bob? That's better. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> Talk to me afterward, I'm here. I'll stay here all day. One by one, we can go in my office, do not leave. You wanna hang out and talk, let's do that, okay? Hey, if you don't know the Lord again, stay here and just ask him in your heart. Look at the cross and go, wow, you did that for me, I want you in my life. That's all it takes, okay? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for giving us the chance to gather in your name, for the chance to hear what your word has to say. We thank you, God, for the instruction of your word, God, for the knowledge of your word, for the, the power of the Spirit that moved so mightily to, to convict us. God, I pray, by your Spirit, heal marriages. Today may be a great beginning for some. God, today I pray, save those that don't know you. And I pray, you give them the words. Bless us, please. We need you desperately. Have your way in this church for Christ's glory. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great weekend. Praise God.